Wearing the jewel on his neck, Satrajit entered Dwaraka. He shone as brightly as the sun itself, O king, and thus he went unrecognized because of the jewel's effulgence. As the people looked at Satrajit from a distance, his brilliance blinded them. They presumed he was the sun god Surya. From ancient times, the idea of wearing on your head or on your ears or around your neck or on your your fingers, a great gem, is an ancient early instinct of man. Da sempre eh, l'Occidente è stato meravigliato dallo splendore dei eh, regnanti e dei potenti dell'India e eh, questo splendore era legato ai gioielli che si indossavano. This exhibition represents 400 years of Indian jewelry, spanning from the great days of the Mughal Empire through to the 18th century, a period of political chaos, the British Raj in the 19th century, until contemporary designers who are working in India or inspired by Indian jewelry. These ancient walls with their eastern motifs belong to neither the Jal Mahal, the water palace in Jaipur, nor to Delhi's Jama Masjid, the world reflecting mosque. This is Venice, and we're in the Doge's Palace, residence of the Doge's and former seat of the city's government. Its inlaid marble and arabesques offer the perfect backdrop for exhibiting the most astonishing of oriental treasures, the Al Tani collection of Indian jewels. Assembled with passion by His Highness Sheikh Hamad bin Abdullah Al Tani, a member of the Qatari royal family, these clusters of gems, necklaces, and artifacts adorned with precious stones will take visitors on an enchanting journey through a legendary history of lost empires. The collection has been formed between 2010 and now. It is nevertheless the most comprehensive collection of its kind, with an enormous depth and breadth in each and every section of the exhibition, spanning from the 16th century until the present day. The Altani collection really regroups pieces from former Indian treasuries and creates in one uh, opportunity a chance to really see how rich the gem culture of India was. È la prima volta che eh, i nostri musei accolgono una mostra di gioielli. Percorso non proprio cronologico, ma attraverso molti secoli di arte indiana, è stato eh, da noi accolto per approfondire e capire di più eh, di questa civiltà che eh, Venezia aveva uh, sicuramente toccato, che gli esploratori, i navigatori, i mercanti di Venezia avevano conosciuto e, uh, e quindi uh, ci sembra di aver portato qui qualcosa di davvero uh, significativo per capire di più. What immediately strikes us about this exhibition is how deeply significant these jewels are in Indian culture. They symbolize membership to a particular caste, a person's region of origin, and their marital status. What is most surprising, however, especially for Westerners, is the fact that these necklaces, bracelets, and rings were worn mostly by men and far less frequently by women. Indeed, their priceless value and exquisite craftsmanship made them the prized possessions of emperors, kings, and maharajas. The splendor of the stones reflected the sovereign's prestige and benevolence, 
whilst the diamond's hardness symbolized virility and power. La funzione di questi eh, gioielli affonda le radici anche nella tradizione religiosa indiana. C'è una un legame sottile non dichiarato eh, di eh, luminosità attraverso il gioiello perché le divinità portavano anche loro questi gioielli. Although the Buddha renounced a life of luxury and didn't wear jewels, the enlightened bodhisattva practitioners, freed from the cycle of reincarnation, did. The sparkling gems adorning their bodies reflected the glory, aura, and sacred splendor surrounding them. Precious stones and their twinkling light were seen as talismans which could even influence the life of man. In traditional Hinduism, there were nine stones that were considered to be auspicious. This was known as the Navratna, the nine precious stones, the, the nine gems. And it was believed that each gem was associated with a different planetary influence. So in order to balance your horoscope, you wore a piece of jewelry with the nine gems represented. We must always be cognizant of the fact that in India, Gemstones were not just worn for their beauty or for their value. They had a deeper purpose. They had a cosmic meaning. One wore a gem to balance one's horoscope, to bring good health, to bring good fortune, to bring protection, uh, to counter an evil force around one. All nine precious stones of the Navaratna were available in India or its neighboring countries, which partly explains the degree of perfection attained in the gems of the subcontinent. Diamonds came from the mines of Golconda, sapphires from Kashmir, and rubies from Burma, whilst pearls from the Persian Gulf were washed up on Indian shores by the monsoons. India was the recipient of huge metal wealth. And the metal wealth, combined with the mineral wealth, led to the creation of a very rich tradition of jewelry. There are certain things that are very distinctive about Indian jewelry. One of them is the use of a very pure gold, in which jewelers had perfected a way of setting gems without any visible mounts. This is known as the Kundan setting, and you'll see it throughout the collection. And it's rather extraordinary if it's your first vision of Indian jewelry to see how you can have an object or a jewel that is completely covered with diamonds and rubies and emeralds without any claws and without any mounts. Lo sviluppo della gioielleria in India ebbe un impulso straordinario con l'avvento di una dinastia straniera nel subcontinente indiano, i Mogul. Erano una popolazione di origine timuri, discendendo cioè da uh, Tamerlano, uno dei grandi conquistatori dell'Asia dopo Gengis Khan. E per una certa parte erano discendenti anche per linea uh, materna da Gengis Khan stesso. Like their ancestors Tamerlane and Genghis Khan, the Mughals wreaked terror on the battlefield. But they also knew how to appreciate art and beauty. Despite being born sword in hand, they knew the pleasure of stooping down to smell the scent of a flower. It is thanks to their love of all the precious and refined things nature has to offer that this exhibition in Venice exists. Gems bearing the glorious names of sovereigns light up the darkness. The first section of the exhibition, it really focuses on dynastic gems and jewels. We open with a group of spinels, 
Spinels are stones from Central Asia that look a little bit like rubies. And according to the uh, traditions of the ancestors of the Mughal emperors, spinels were often inscribed with the name of a ruler and a title of a ruler. And they were passed from one generation to the next, in a sense, creating a dynastic purpose to the jewel. So if an emperor received a spinel engraved with the name of his great-grandfather, he really held a tender value uh, to the stone. You know, he really felt that it embodied the spirit of his ancestor and reflected his greatness and his glory. In wearing it against his skin, it empowered him with a sense of his dynasty and his lineage. Emeralds of substantial scale are very evident in this component of the exhibition and it's remarkable to see in any place in the world so many fine emeralds. We have to remember that the Mughals loved the emerald because it was green. In Islam, green is the color of paradise. It was believed to be the favorite color of the Prophet. So it was worn with great joy and with a sense of auspiciousness. You know, to wear an emerald was believed to be an enormous fortune. However, in India, the most propitiatory and benevolent power was attributed to diamonds. And there are many to be found in this Aladdin's cave, including the famous 17-carat diamond Arcot II, gifted to Queen Charlotte of Great Britain by the Nawab of Arcot in the second half of the 18th century, it was eventually embedded into the crown of King George IV. Interestingly, it was actually the reputation of gems as large as these which led to the rise of the Mughal dynasty two centuries earlier. Its founder, Babur, left Central Asia in the 16th century when his attraction for jewels brought him to India, then under the reign of the powerful Sultan Ibrahim Lodi. Babur was a genius, a great conductor. And in 1526, distrugge col suo piccolo esercito le armate del sultano Ibrahim uh, dei Lodi e quindi entra vittorioso in Delhi e fonda la dinastia. However, the Mughals' extravagant tastes do not date back to Babura the conqueror. It was his son, Humian, a skillful warrior who first encountered exquisite Persian art while staying at the palace of Shah Tamasp. Humian fell to his death by tripping on his robe when he attempted to bow upon hearing the call to prayer. Nevertheless, it is him we have to thank for the birth of Mughal art, literature, architecture, and jewelry. Humayun, in quel periodo, vivendo a contatto con la splendida corte del dello Shah Tamasp si porterà in India a due pittori e si creerà una fusione tra questo stile figurativo straordinario iraniano e il naturalismo indiano. The second part of the exhibition, dedicated to jade and rock crystal artifacts, bears witness to a rich array of shapes and colors, delicate cameos depicting the sovereign, which were worn by courtiers, adorned cups, such as this one belonging to Emperor Jahangir, made out of jade because he believed it could detect the presence of poison in drinks. Artifacts portraying the life and clothing of the Indian courts, swords and daggers with handles representing animals, opium spoons, mouthpieces for hookers, archers' thumb rings, falconry cuffs, fly whisks decorated with gems, and back scratches tipped with bejeweled hands. One of the masterpieces here, which is an extraordinary work of art, is a small dagger made for the Emperor Shah Jahan. He was the aesthete and a ruler who built the Taj Mahal. So this little dagger belonged to Shah Jahan and the blade has his inscription and his title on it. What is extraordinary is the hilt. If you look carefully at the hilt, you will see at the top a head of 
a figure, a young boy, who is wearing a ruffled collar and an earring. And you can see, uh, when you examine closely, that this is imagery coming from Europe. It might be a European boy or it might be a blackamoor, but clearly it's an image which the emperor cherished and loved, maybe as a talisman, maybe as a symbol of, of good fortune. The third part of the Altani collection is an exhibition of gold and enameled objects and jewels, artifacts which demonstrate the highest levels of craftsmanship. For example, Emperor Aurangzeb's Persian-inspired pen box and inkwell, the rose water bottle encrusted with rubies, pearls and emeralds, amulet lockets containing miniature copies of the Quran, and highly symbolic animal figurines, such as the tiger head adorning the throne of Tipu Sultan, proud ruler of the Kingdom of Mysore, or the Mughal parrots from the city of Hyderabad. When a parrot's shadow was cast over a man, it was believed he would become king. One of the great pieces of this section, and indeed the, 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 the symbolic image of this exhibition, is a superb pendant which is made as a figure of a deity using an extra large natural pearl for the body and using gold, emeralds, diamonds, rubies and sapphires for the head and its tail. It's a snake divinity. And what's extraordinary about this piece, this pendant, is it's really directly inspired by Italian Renaissance jewelry of a type that if you go to the Museo delle Argenti in Florence, you will see many examples of superb pendants in jewelry modeled around wonders of nature. It was an age in Europe of exploration of nature and a love of naturalia. The man who sparked the Mughals' interest in Italian and Western art and culture was one of the greatest, most tolerant and most enlightened leaders of all antiquity, Akbar, who became emperor at the young age of 14. During his reign, Akbar founded a new city, Fatpur Sikri, which was destined to host gatherings of religious leaders of all faiths. Akbar arrivò alla fine della sua esistenza a praticare l'interreligiosità. C'è una bellissima immagine, una miniatura, in cui è raffigurata una di queste riunioni serali e si vede in questa miniatura lui, padre Acquaviva e dei Sufi. Quindi lui creava queste interrelazioni tra religioni. This Venetian exhibition is very much in keeping with Akbar's spirit, fusing together different cultures and religions with a love of jewels. In the Scrutinio room of the Doge's palace hang great pictures depicting the Battle of Lepanto between the fleets of the Ottoman Empire and the Holy League. In the palace's architecture, however, with its intricate pinnacles and pointed windows, one can sense the Asian influence and openness to exotic worlds which made Venice the gateway to the East for centuries. This is the perfect city for showcasing the Altani collection, a cultural fusion of two worlds. Palazzo Ducale è credo il più importante edificio eh, gotico di tutta l'architettura italiana, sicuramente lo è di Venezia. Questo palazzo ha un aspetto gotico, un aspetto rinascimentale, un aspetto più tardo manierista, nel 300, nel 400, nel 500 ha subito delle variazioni, ma non c'è dubbio che eh, qui questa sua maestosità a fronte il bacino di San Marco era forse eh, la prima immagine che colpiva chi arrivava con, la, con le navi eh, dal, dall'Oriente e arrivava in questo porto. I veneziani, insieme alle spezie, controllavano o quasi il mercato dei diamanti e dei preziosi, ma soprattutto dei diamanti. E prima che non venissero fatte le scoperte di diamanti in Brasile e poi in Sudafrica, i, i diamanti che giravano per il mondo erano tutti indiani. E poi per molto tempo sono, Venezia è stata molto attenta al controllo del taglio dei diamanti. E anche il Koh-i-Nur 
famoso è stato tagliato da un tagliatore veneziano invitato dall'imperatore Shah Jahan a rendere più luminoso il diamante. India's openness to the West and tolerance of other religions came to a sudden halt in 1658 when the severe ruler Aurangzeb rose to the Mughal throne. He was to be the last ruler of the empire, now too vast to stay united. In 1739, Nadir Shah of Persia sacked Delhi and returned home with 39 cartloads of jewels. In the tumultuous period that followed, more land would be lost to European powers such as Great Britain and wealthy local rulers such as the Nawabs and Maharajas. What does this mean for jewellery? In the 18th century we see, and it continues in the 19th century, jewellery forms becoming more extravagant, larger scale. A second thing that happens with the rise of Western dominance in India, I speak particularly of the British, is that Indian princes start to be influenced by Western setting techniques. They begin to be influenced by the claw settings of Europe. Eventually they become influenced by the platinum and the silver settings of Europe. And the symmetry of European jewelry also, also starts to enter Indian jewelry. So we start to see a period of fusion where Indian jewelers are beginning to adopt Western techniques. More than techniques, it's Western style. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Indian Maharajas and their families often traveled to Paris and London, taking their family jewels to the great jewelry houses, such as Cartier, to have them remounted in the latest Western fashion. This created an intense exchange of Indian and European styles, encouraging Jacques Cartier to visit Delhi in 1911, where he met several Maharajas and, above all, absorbed the luxurious aesthetics of India, which he conveyed in an extensive range of Art Deco masterpieces. One example is the Tutti Frutti brooches, so named for their likeness to the coloured sweets popular at the time. Another is the necklace created for the Maharaja of Nawanagar, which was even worn to Truman Capote's legendary ball at New York's Plaza Hotel in 1966. So particularly fine representation of this dialogue between Indian princes and Western jewelry houses is seen in the famous Tiger's Eye Turban Ornament. And this is an ornament that was designed to be worn in the turban by Maharaja Digvijay Singhji of Nawanagar, a state in Gujarat in western India. So Cartier made an extraordinary turban ornament, totally contemporary for a classical Indian shape, using um, a beautiful golden colored diamond of more than 60 carats. And um, it's a tour de force of 20th century jewelry and an extraordinary synthesis of Indian functionality and European taste and styling. What's uh, exceptional is the stone itself was so precious and beautiful that it was designed so that it could be removed from the mount so the Maharaja could play with it. The last section of the exhibition focuses on contemporary jewelry. It's perhaps unique in the sense that other collections of Indian jewelry have focused always on historical material. This collection really looks at Indian jewelry traditions and their influences today. We have the work of a small group of really superlative jewelers. We have Bulgari also. We have uh, the famous Parisian jeweler Jar. And we have the work of Bhagat, which, who is an Indian jeweler based in Bombay, but who is inspired by Mughal tradition and Indian tradition. And one of the pieces I'd like to speak about in particular is a extremely delicate and inventive design by Jar which is a brooch in the form of an Indian cusped window. The window is actually defined by a historic emerald. And the cusp window, if you turn it on the other side, you'll see that the gold framework is made in the form of a jali. A jali is a pierced screen. 
typical of Indian architecture, which was used to let air flow without visibility. So it was traditionally found in palaces, especially in the women's portion of the palace, so they could see outside without anybody seeing them. The work of gifted contemporary designers such as Jar show us how the fine artisan craftsmanship of Indian jewelers has been preserved to the highest standards from the Mughal Empire to the modern day. Before our eyes, here in Venice, these sparkling treasures celebrate centuries-old traditions, the work of men who could transform the subterranean fruits of the earth into works of art, manuscripts of light, which tell the tales of one of our world's most fascinating lands, India. India è un grandioso crogiolo di umanità. Molte volte lascia perplessi, eh, può sgomentare per queste sue contraddizioni continue, ma non cessa di stupire.